Mm. So welcome everyone. Uh, today, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Terry Gregory. And uh, Terry is uh, since November 2018, a team leader at the research group Digital Transformation at the ICA um, or EZR in, in German. Um, and his uh, research focus is in the uh, labor markets effects of digitalization and automation. Um, inequality on labor markets, uh, as well as minimum wage requirements. He obtained a uh, degree from the University of Bonn in economics and uh, the Karls Universität in Prague. Um, and he also in January 2015 finished his uh, PhD at the University of Regensburg. Uh, so he has seen quite some uh, European or German universities. I think even Prague is, is uh, supposed to be one of the oldest uh, European universities, but also the oldest German university because at the, at the time it was established, I think it was still on German soil, but uh, you know, that, that might be disputed. Uh, and so in 2009, he worked for the uh, Zentrum für Europäische Wirtschaftsforschung, uh, ZEW, uh, which is also well known, I think, to all of you. And uh, he is also a senior researcher in the research focus digitalization and international um, uh, division of labor. Uh, today, he will present his paper. I think it's currently a working paper how do workers adjust when firms adopt new technologies? And I think that's really at the core of our research group or one of the main topics. And we are very much looking forward uh, to your presentation. And without further ado, uh, the floor is yours, Terry. Well, thanks a lot for the nice introduction. And I'm uh, happy to present here in this seminar. Um, a lot of great speakers in the past. Um, yeah, so this is joint work with uh, Sabrina Gens from from the University of Utrecht uh, and three co-authors from the IAB, Markus Janza, Florian Lehmer and Britta Mattes. And it's about uh, how do workers adjust when firms adopt new technologies. So basically we are trying to answer the question um, of how, uh, what happens to workers in firms when they invest into these modern technologies. And let me uh, motivate my talk a little bit um, by the different waves of technology that we have been on going through in the last uh, yeah, 100, 200 years. So it all started with mechanization. So the first industrial revolution, which basically was at the end of the 18th century, the invention or the, with the help of water and steam power. This was a big in innovation that led to the introduction of mechanical production. And then there is agreement that we have uh, went through a second industrial revolution, basically described as uh, the era of electrification which is basically described as with the help or the invention of electric, electric power that led to mass production and the division of labor. So Henry Ford's uh, assembly lines and so on. And then there's also, I think, agreement that we have uh, since the 1970s uh, went or have been going through a new era, uh, the era of computerization or digitalization with the introduction of electronics and IT, which further enabled um, the automation of production and also new services in, uh, in, in, the, in the service industries. And then according to experts, and I think it's still an ongoing debate, is that we are now entering or in the middle of a fourth industrial revolution um, or a second digital revolution as the US uh, refer to it. And it's basically described as a deeper connection or a connection between the physical and the digital spheres so by so-called cyber physical systems. So basically machines are increasingly connected and, um, and they're also uh, connected to new uh, uh, platforms in the internet and so on. And um, I think the, the question now is uh, whether these new, well, this new generation of technologies that can be described as, for instance, um, uh, by tools such as AI, so artificial intelligence, uh, augmented reality, or Internet of Things to be more specific on specific technologies that are out there. Uh, and the question is um, whether this will, uh, yeah, what, what, how economies will adjust to these new technologies. And there have, there have been a lot of claims in the past that these new technologies might have a large impact on the labor market. And there are at least two things to mention here. So the one is that there have been claims that there would be large reductions in overall employment. 
uh, this was uh, stressed by studies such as, I think the most famous one is Frey and Osborne that have been predicting that uh, almost every second job in the US will be uh, displaced by, by new technologies. And uh, I've done some work on my own on this topic and um, for the German government, for the OECD, and actually even a short article published in Economic Letters where we actually show that these um, approaches are, are largely overestimated. Uh, so one argument that we have put forward is that many of these studies, they look at occupations and they are thereby neglecting the large heterogeneity of tasks at the workplace within occupations. So when they assign a high probability to a secretary um, of being automated next uh, years, they basically neglect that two uh, jobs um, that, that are in the same occupation may vary very differently according to their tasks. So the one is maybe doing these routine tasks according to the descriptions, but others might already have focused and shifted their task towards more non-routine tasks. And if you take that into account, um, you get much uh, lower numbers. And uh, besides all these studies are, uh, have been wrongly, I, I, would, I would say, interpreted in the media, they all focus on the potential for automation and they don't really address the question of net employment effects. Uh, so if you take also jobs that are created into account, actually, uh, that's what I have been showing um, in, a, in, a, in a study uh, that was published in the Journal of the European Economic Association, where we actually show for Europe that the net effect is actually positive. So I think the, it's less of a question, I think, regarding these new technologies, whether we are ending or heading towards a, a future without jobs. It's more the question, and that's, that has been put forward more by Bernie Orbson and others and Webb, that it's maybe more important to look at what different parts of the workforce may be uh, uh, affected. So it's less of, of the absolute number of jobs, but more the structure of jobs that is, that is changing. But of course, for this, we need um, more research on the micro adjustments that are happening to really understand these adjustments at the firm level, at the individual level. And uh, one reason for why uh, we think at least uh, there haven't been so many studies of this is because of the lack of data. So we don't, we are really missing specific data on a firm, on an individual level, on these new technologies. And at the same time, uh, a corresponding analysis that really look how these technologies that are implemented on this firm level or used on an individual level, how they actually uh, lead to uh, adjustments. And that's exactly where this paper jumps in. So this paper, first of all, wants to deal with the issue that we are lacking specific data. So we are building a linked employer employee data set. Uh, we have, or we have built uh, such a such a such a data database now. So it consists, and I'll be more brief on that, of a firm survey among about two thousand firms, um, where we survey um, these firms on their work equipment. And the nice feature of this is that we have uh, information now on this work equipment for the current, which is two thousand sixteen, and past two thousand eleven, and we distinguish by the wave of technology. So basically the concept that I have been, uh, that I have introduced on my previous slide, the four industrial revolutions, that's exactly the, this vintage of technology or these waves of technology, those, this will be the framework for the, for, the, for, the, for the analysis that will follow. Maybe it's also important to mention that um, our survey covers both manufacturing and service. I talk a little bit more about the literature, but the core uh, feature of the, of the past literature is that they have been mostly focusing on robots or other technologies very specific to, uh, to manufacturing industries, largely neglecting uh, what is going on in the service industries. And then we link this, this survey to admin data to actually be able to follow, to track workers in those firms that invested and see how their employment careers have been developing. So, that's our first contribution with this, this new data set. And then we want to, first of all, actually describe, since the data is new, uh, we want to document adoption of modern technologies in Germany. So, I mean, there's a large uh, discussion in the media that all these technologies have been, are, are being used, but we still don't really know uh, the amount to which these technologies uh, are diffusing across the economy. So we want to, first of all, describe uh, how widespread are new technologies in the German economy, we want to say a little bit more about which firms tend to invest into those technologies, also distinguishing between uh, recent and, and older technologies. And we want to also um, 
describe or we also described um, how the workers differ between those firms. And then we get to the heart of the study where we basically try to provide some first, um, not necessarily fully cautious, but at least uh, suggestive evidence on how these uh, employment, how employment stability and wages of, of workers are adjusting or have been adjusting to these technology investments. We also say something about how different these effects are across worker groups to, to say something about the shifts uh, in the workforce structure. And we also uh, do small analysis on the hiring margin because it could be that there are different things happening there um, than uh, with respect to the, to the, to the core and police staff. So let me give you a brief preview of the results in case I don't make it through the presentation entirely. Um, so modern technologies, we call them 4.0 technologies. So basically technologies of the newest generation, they still play a, a relatively minor role across German firms. So we find that one in five, according to our definition, one in five firms invested into connected 4.0 technologies between 2011 and 2016. And um, we find that these, uh, but, but we find that nevertheless, in these few firms, uh, actually the share of the work equipment that is associated to these more recent technologies is actually rising quite fast. So there seems to be a frontier of firms that is investing heavily, um, which could um, um, to, to lead to corresponding polarized uh, picture of technology adoption in Germany. And we see that these modern technologies are mostly coming from firms of the ITST sector. They are larger firms, they are more routine intensive, and they are actually more often providers of these technologies. Regarding the, the results for the adjustments, we find increased employment days and uh, um, with respect to the 3.0 technologies. Um, uh, and the wage gains seem to be, the, 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 those that we find seems to be uh, the result of 4.0 uh, technology investments. And um, what is also perhaps interesting is that all these adjustments, the beneficial adjustments that we find, they all are driven by service providers, which could lead to some more general result that I, that, that I will talk about, that uh, obviously service technologies or office technologies seem to have more beneficial effects than manufacturing technologies. But of course, behind these average shifts, there are, uh, or these average adjustments, there are shifts towards IT-related uh, expert jobs, so very different effects across worker groups, benefiting for especially the IT-related jobs, um, and uh, that also coincides with higher job requirements more non-routine analytic tasks. Um, and interesting, it is actually um, promoting more workers in the middle skilled qualification groups, so vocationally trained workers. I will discuss whether this has something to do with the German system or whether it's simply reflecting uh, um, labor shortages of, of university students, graduates. And uh, also provide some analysis suggesting that the higher margins actually kind of confirming what we are finding for the core staff. So let me um, briefly say something about how we contribute with this study to the literature. So there is basically one core literature that we are directly addressing. That's the literature, the emerging literature that is uh, looking at firm level automation. And what I mean with that is that those are all firms that have actually measures on a firm level on technology adoption, especially robots. So for instance, papers by Achimuklu and co-authors, Agion and co-authors, and also I think uh, Michael Koch has presented here his paper on robots. Um, so they all have uh, specific data on firm level uh, adoption of robots. And they mostly, mostly find um, positive association to uh, outcomes like uh, output, productivity, employment, and even uh, although also reductions in the labor cost share. And which is perhaps more related to what we are doing um, is the study by Humlum, which, folk, which actually shows that these effects are limited to skilled workers, such as computer analysts um, or um, engineers or researchers, while the negative effects are actually also um, behind those average effects um, seen for production workers. That's something that could be related to what we are finding. And then there's a study by Besson et al that have a more they do not focus on robots, but have a general measure that comes closer to our study. Um, so it also captures what's happening in the service sector and they find an increase in the incumbent workers probability to separate from their employers um, uh, um, yeah, followed by wage losses. 
Now, there's also a second larger literature. I'll talk less about this, but it's about um, those are all studies here. Archimogli Restrepo, Daud et al., Gretz and Michaels, really well known studies that mostly focus on region or industry wide robot adoption. Um, mixed results, some find negative uh, results, some find positive results. Um, but I would like to stress that these are um, measuring something a little bit something else because they have, have these, um, they're not really measuring what is going on on the firm level. And, but nevertheless, it's interesting and comparable in the sense that they also tend to find that uh, the job losses are pronounced, if they find any, they, they seem to be um, seen in the manufacturing industries. And doubt it, I'll even show that they are overcompensated uh, by job growth in service industries, which could be highly related to what we find. Now, let me say a little bit more about the data set that we have been building up. So first of all, um, so the first component of our data is this survey, this uh, so-called uh, uh, IAB CDW Labor Market 4.0 Establishment Survey, which uh, where we roughly surveyed 2,000 firms um, in both manufacturing and service sector. Um, we uh, stratified the survey. So we basically uh, had at least 50 interviews within firm size sales. Uh, uh, so four firm, firm size cells, two region cells, and five industry cells to make it mostly, uh, to make it representative across these um, different dimensions. And the content of this interview was the relevance of modern digital technologies. So we have some general questions on this, but then the most important uh, um, set of questions is on the specific share of their work equipment by wave of technology which we also ask uh, not only for the, the day of the interview, but also retrospectively for the year, for five years before uh, the interview. So 2011 and 2016, which then allows us to see, to measure shifts in these, uh, in the structure of technology across those firms. Uh, also some background information. And um, yeah, so then I think a big advantage is that we conducted the survey based on a random sample of firms registered at the, German Federal Employment Agency, which then allows us to link social security records of all the workers employed in those firms. So roughly 170,000 uh, workers. And for all these workers, we have basic personal characteristics such as gender, age, qualification. We have uh, detailed information on the job characteristics such as employment status, wage, occupation, requirement level, and so on. <clears throat> And finally, um, we also can uh, create some firm characteristics such as the industry, location, and firm size. So basically we merge that data together to then allow us to analyze uh, what we are up to. And, um, and, uh, and now I would like to come to the, to the core of the survey, which is the heart of the whole study. So it's basically the concept of how we actually measure technology adoption. So what we did is we, we first of all abstract a little bit. So we assume that uh, firms can be thought of as having uh, of producing um, or, and having some kind of office of communication equipment. Um, so all firms have some kind of office of communication equipment and only those that produce opens up the production equipment. So basically these two, uh, uh, these two areas. And now we distinguish um, the work equipment into three levels of technology following the concept of the fourth industrial revolution. So it basically all starts with um, uh, one 2.0 technologies. And for, um, for our purpose, we will kind of combine this. It's, it's, these are all technologies before, before the digital revolution. So it's basically capturing uh, a, a, that, yeah. it's, it's, it's the description is that humans manually conduct these work processes and it's not IT, it's not, it's not, there's no IT involved. So in office and communication, this would be some non, not IT supported work equipment like an analog telephone, a fax machine, a copy machine, and so on. And in production, it would be a manually controlled machine. So also no IT involved. So some drilling machine, at least the older generation of drilling machines without any, uh, without any IT support, some motor vehicle or an X-ray machine. And then we come to the next category, the 3.0 technologies, where basically the digital uh, components start to get involved. So, uh, with the, so with the help of um, 
electronics and IT, basically uh, the work process is indirectly done, uh, conducted by the work equipment. So for instance, in office, this would be some kind of computer, basic computer, a CD machine or electronic checkout machine. And in production, you can think of it as an indirectly controlled machine. So some kind of industrial robot, a CNC machine, at least to the extent that it's not uh, fully automated and not fully connected, integrated into the central IT system. And then we move to the highest category, the 4.0 technologies. So here it's really about um, office and communication equipment that is fully integrated into the central IT systems. So basically some really modern technologies such as artificial intelligence or other devices that automatically that do work, a certain work process is automatically done by, by this tool. And I think it's even easier to understand in the production. So it would be a, like an assembly line, which is fully automated. So basically, uh, the humans are not involved into the uh, specific um, work task. And then we basically, um, or, and this measure is basically a measure that increases in the degree of automation and digitalization, as you can see. And then we have, uh, we asked the firms to roughly give us the share of their work equipment into these three classes, by office of communication and production. So uh, we get, get a share uh, that adds up to 100%. And um, you might worry now that, uh, okay, so there might be differences in how people understood this question. So you have to think of it as a subjective measure that could reflect both frequency uh, of machines, uh, the monetary value of the machine, the relative monetary value, or the relative size. Um, so it's a subjective measure that is, that is basically aggregating these different components. We didn't go into detail uh, there. And, um, but I think the most important is that we, we, we ask this question or we, we get these shares for today, so 2016 and five years in the past. So it's really, the focus is really on the shifts across time in these shares. So it's not so much about um, whether the share of 4.0 was 21% or maybe 25%. It's more the shift that we see over time. And we believe that the interviewees uh, have a constant concept when they answer their question for these two questions today and tomorrow. And I think that's important to stress. Um, now, of course, if there are any questions, please interrupt me. Um, happy to answer uh, questions. So now, if, now we have these um, technology shares across these three different types of technology waves or levels. So I call them S uh, as an element of 1, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0 by office and communication and production. And now we want to make things a little bit easier and do not use the full variation of the data because it might also introduce some new problems. So we basically simply now aggregate um, office of communication and production. So we simply say that uh, we calculate a technology share that is a weighted average of office, office, office tools and production tools. Um, but of course it's, it's still uh, firm specific, it's technology S specific and it varies over time. We do some a lot of robustness checks on this on this on, on this weighting, so it doesn't really matter what we what we use for for weighting scheme here, and then we simply look at the changes in these technology shares, these firm specific technology shares across time. So basically, the difference between 2016 and 2011. So we have shifts in technology shares for those three different types of technologies. And then we um, go even make it even simpler, but by saying let's let's just divide firms uh, into adopters and non-adopters, and we distinguish adopters by saying so if a firm mainly incre mainly increased its share of S technology, so for instance 4.0 technologies, so if it mainly invested into 4.0 technologies, um, it becomes a 4.0 adopter. If it mainly, adopt, mainly adopted 3.0 technologies, he becomes a 3.0 adopter. And if he mainly adopted the oldest generation of technologies, then he becomes a non-adopter. So everything 1, 2.0, I will call in the, in the further, further uh, process of the paper, I will call it non-adopters. Everything is everything before the digital revolution. And you can see, I mean, there are some issues that we can discuss later that, um, uh, of course, there are some firms that have no change in their technology shares. So then we use the initial share and that this introduces some issues of whether they are like a recent adopter or early adopter. But I, I, uh, 
just as a, as, as a rough summary, I mean, 63% are really recent adopters, so they see a change. And we also do some robustness analysis where we basically um, separate these two types of firms. So basically here, here are, here's the division of firms across this, this definition. And this is, to some extent, it's a description of technology adoption in Germany. It's, but it's also kind of like a summary of what happens, of how our uh, measure, what our measure actually does, how it actually classifies firms. And you will see it's quite, it's, it's quite a reasonable classification that, it, that, that came out. So let's start with um, the non-adopters. So the non-adopters were those that mainly invest into the one 2.0 technologies. So that technologies that do not um, rely on IT at all. And uh, what we see is that um, the, the, the work equipment, uh, so you see here the, 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 the three type of firms. So 29% are non-adopters, 49% are 3.0 adopters and 22% are 4.0 adopters. And um, we then summarize here the, for these three different types of adopter firms, we, we basically summarize the, the technology shares so that you can see how, how classification worked. And so if you take the non-adopters, the work equipment consists mainly of older technologies. So 60 or um, uh, 86% of their work equipment is basically one 2.0 technologies. They only have 10% of technologies of um, the 3.0 class. And this also has not been changing over time. So this is uh, really describing those non-adopters. Well, you see no shifts and it's mainly the older technologies. Now let's move to the 3.0 adopters. So their work equipment already considerably consists of 3.0 technologies. They also use a lot of 1.2.0 technologies, but it's mostly 3.0 technologies. And that has been also increasing over time. That's basically reflecting our definition. So they are mainly, they have been mainly uh, investing, see the change down here, 10% plus change. They're mainly investing into 3.0 technologies. And if you then move to the frontier firms, the 4.0 adopters, they have been using already considerable amount of uh, 4.0 technologies. So roughly 12%. It has been increasing to 23%, and it's also the main uh, shift here. So they're mainly investing into those four zero technologies. Uh, what is perhaps also interesting is that they're all basically investing, um, they're downgrading their, their non-digital technologies um, towards those 4.0 ones. So they're not going through a step like, first of all, three zero and then four zero, but rather um, jumping directly to 4.0 technologies. So now, um, just very briefly, I would like to say that um, there were some, uh, some comments in the past that we had um, saying, okay, you have this nice new measure. And uh, so how does it relate to existing measures in the literature? And of course, I mean, there are these two, tip, two very popular data sets. That's the robot, industrial robots data set and the ICT capital uh, data set uh, or ICT capital data from the EU CLEMS data um, that are only available on the industry level. But nevertheless, if we aggregate our measure to the industry level, we can, we can do some correlations and show how this is, is, if there are some plausible patterns. And what you can see here is exactly this. So we, so we have here the uh, column one and two is our uh, non-digital technologies. Then we have the 3.0 technologies in columns three and four, and then the, the most recent technologies in columns five and six. And um, just focus on columns two, column two now, because we basically also uh, do some estimations with some industry fixed effects. Um, and they basically show that industrial robots are positively correlated with digital technologies, both 3.0 and 4.0, and negatively correlated with, the, with, uh, with our non-digital technology. So that's actually a plausible pattern. Um, it's also quite plausible that the most positive coefficient is for the 3.0 technologies, because that's actually our class of technologies that is related to those industrial robots. It's basically the, 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 uh, the older generation of technologies, not the really recent ones. And uh, we find a similar pattern also for the ICT capital data. So negatively correlated, so more ICT within industries, more ICT capital is negatively correlated with our uh, share of uh, non-digital technologies and it's positively correlated um, with our three and 4.0 technologies, again, a more positive effect for three zero. So that's it's quite possible. It's it's we're we're measuring um, our measure is actually quite um, 
uh, showing causal patterns with respect to the existing data sets on technology. Um, at the same time, um, as you can see here, these, these, the, the correlation with the 4.0 is it's much weaker, suggesting that we are capturing here something, perhaps something even more recent, some, something that is not so much, uh, the variation that we are capturing is not in the, in the other data as much. Um, and of course, we have all this on the firm level. So let's, um, let me, before I go to the estimations, let me go to another, let me ask another question. And it's basically which firms invest into those technologies? And let's start with 3.0 technologies. So what we find here is so we regress the probability to be a 3.0 adopter on different selective variables. And we start with a, a variable, it's a dummy variable of be, being a manufacturer or a service provider. We have a variable on the whether the firm is um, among the knowledge intensive sectors, although without ICT, we, ICT is, se is a separate dummy. Then uh, there's a variable whether you are a provider of new technologies. That's a survey uh, variable that we asked. And uh, there's another variable here, um, whether the firm is uh, the large firm, so a firm with more than 200 employees. And then because there's also the hypothesis that firms that have a lot of routine tasks, uh, that, that's basically a measure for the automation potential. Um, so we integrate that as well in the analysis and then the share of university graduates. And what we see is that at least for the three O technologies, it's significantly more often uh, the case that firms invest into these technologies when they come from the knowledge intensive sectors without ICT, but the other variables seem to not be really significant. Now, if you move to the four zero technologies, we find a little bit of a different pattern. We see already that manufacturers have a less likelihood to invest into those technologies, already hinting towards that service providers are uh, more uh, active in investing into those really recent technologies. It seems to be largely driven by firms from the ICT sector. Interestingly, when we put in the provider dummy, that's also very significant. and. Uh, the coefficient for ICT vanishes, so it seems to be capturing the same story. So basically, it's it, it, it our IC, it, uh, um, it's basically the investors are providers of new technologies from the ICT sector. Um, moreover, we find that being a large firm also increases the likelihood. So 16 percentage points higher likelihood of being a 4.0 adopter, and there's also a high likelihood of adopting into more technologies, more recent technologies, when firms have a high routine intensity share, basically confirming what previous studies have found that the more routine um, the work is, the more it can be automated. And interestingly, we do not find any significant effects for the share of university graduates. That fits actually to what, we, what I will show you later, that we do not find this large uh, correlation uh, between technology adoption and share of high qualified. And that could be either that they are not so much required, it's more of a story of medium uh, medium skilled workers, or it could be reflecting some kind of uh, labor shortages. Um, we can discuss this later. Uh, Terry, so, can I yeah. ask you a question? Of course. Um, if you show that, um, actually, that, that would have been actually my question already when you, when you showed the survey measure. I, I'm wondering whether what you're capturing is not that a couple of firms are also investing in 4.0 technology and, and other firms do the full, full thing. And you're comparing in a sense, apples with oranges or like in your positive survey response as to say, both of them could be in there. And if I look at this table, actually coming from the financial service industry, I would say, you're capturing two types of firms. Like if you have firms with uh, 200 and more employees, what you're capturing is for instance, Deutsche Bank. They are also investing in 4.0 technologies like let's say cloud computing and blockchain technology, blah, blah, blah. But it's not at the core of their business, right? I mean, they, they also have like more than 4,000 applications that run still on software from the 80s or from the 60s even. And then you have others like the providers of new technology that might be really new firms like uh, Solaris Bank, which is an API bank, is only doing this kind of business. And, and they would also invest in these new technologies. But it's not, I would say, like the two concepts you are showing here or the two measures you're showing here, they are not in a sense additive. They could be 
um, you know, it's it's either the one or the other. W would you think that's the case, or do you know what I mean? Or yeah, so I mean, what I mean, one thing that that is true, and if I go back to my definition, maybe we can discuss this a little bit more. So when we classify our firms, we say that if you are mainly an if you mainly shifted your technology towards, for instance, four zero, you become a four zero adopter. And but also, um, if you, and if you didn't shift your four zero technology because you <laughs> had already invested into it, this could be something like the Deutsche Bank that didn't invest much because they already have a lot of, of these technologies. Then you um, then you're also classified as a four zero adopter. But then we uh, label those as like an early adopter. They had they, they did not invest recently, but they have done it er in an earlier period. And what we do is we basically distinguish our results later on between early adopters and recent adopters. Okay. This could address a little bit what you are what you are saying. So what it shows is that I mean that the results that we find later on are basically confirmed, or it's basically driven by the recent adopters. So it's not a phenomenon of early adopters, but rather a recent uh, recent uh, recent adopters. So it's not that our results later on are actually driven, at least our evidence suggests this, is not really driven by firms that have simply already done this in the past and our results are only reflecting that. So that's what I can say here. And regarding the provider variable, I mean, this is something that we haven't exploited in more detail, um, but basically, um, yeah, so the obviously what, what, what the descriptives are showing is that if you characterize those four zero adopters, they are mainly also, uh, there's a lot, there's a high, high likelihood that you're also a provider of these new technologies. So we could invest this a little bit more by, for instance, uh, distinguishing our results between being a provider and not a provider. I think, I don't know if we've done that yet. It's a good point. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know if this addresses your question perfectly, but um, yeah, I think this, you know. I see where you're coming from. And uh, uh, only as a side note, I would think that Deutsche Bank is actually a late adopter, but <laughs> I don't know. You probably know it better if, if they're on your sample. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Well, I don't know. It's an anonymous uh, uh, survey, so I, I don't know who, which firm is behind uh, the data points. But uh, yeah. Um, okay. So um, so this was a rough description of basically which firms are investing into those technologies, and we also did a little bit on how the workers in those firms differ. I'm not going to say too much here. Uh, rather move to the results, but um, basically the core messages are that the bulk of workers they are employed in the three zero adopters. So about half of the workers come from the non-adopt, uh, come from the 3.0 adopters, which basically makes sense. It's also the half of the firms are actually 3.0 adopters. And what is perhaps more interesting is that uh, 4.0 adopters um, from, the, from the remaining half of workers, three and five are employed in 4.0 adopters, although the, the share of 4.0 adopters is smaller than non-adopters. So it's suggesting that they are more, uh, they are larger and, and, and employ more workers. Regarding the selection of workers into those firms, it's basically a positive selection of workers. They have higher education, they are, um, do more complex tasks, more cognitive tasks, and uh, also have uh, more stable jobs and, and higher salaries. So that's something that we have to take care of in our analysis. And I will talk about that, this positive selection. And, um, and finally, um, the four adopters also seem to be more IT intensive. That was also something that uh, came out in the analysis on the firm level adoption, so um, yeah, so mainly IT jobs. So those are characteristics, both on the firm and individual level that we need to uh, take into account. And I'll show you in a minute how we do this. So this is our, um, this is our approach. So what we do here is we uh, basically estimate the individual level outcomes. So changes in outcome I for individual I, we, 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 we try to explain this with, or we regress this on technology adoption. And we have these two, these two basically these two variables here. So basically three zero adoption is uh, whether you are a firm that mainly invested into three zero adoption, the classification that I showed you above. And the four zero uh, dummy is basically uh, whether that you are uh, mainly a, a four zero ad adopter. And then we hold constant the initial period uh, individual and firm level characteristics. And those are basically demographic characteristics such as gender, age, education, but also employment um, or, or variables that capture the individual employment biographies. So the number of previous employers, share of days employed since, since uh, 1999, 
Then we also have the firm level variables, such as the establishment size. We have sector dummies and federal state dummies. And then basically our beta and gamma capture the, um, the adjustment of individual level outcomes uh, in response to those technology uh, investments. And our outcomes, we start with the accumulated days in employment. We distinguish between those workers that five years later remain employed in their original firm or whether they switch to a different firm, so stayers versus switchers, and also have a, um, an outcome uh, uh, of non-employment, so whether they yeah, transition to unemployment. And uh, we look at wage growth, so changes in wages, and distinguish also between stayers and switchers. So these are the results. Of, well, before I come to the results, I would like to convince you that the two workers that we are comparing, so basically we are comparing two workers that are similar, uh, the one is treated and the, and the one is not. And then we, we track their, their employment biographies. And to convince you that workers from adopters and non-adopters are comparable, setibus paribus, for certain variables that I showed you, they're listed, I would like to uh, provide some, I call the balance tests. So we basically say that if they are really balanced, so if they are really similar, then we should see in the period prior to the investment, conditional on our individual and firm level characteristics, there should be, there should be no effect of 4-0 adoption and 4-0 adoption, like a placebo test. So this is what you can see here. So let's just um, concentrate on columns one to three in the top left, where we uh, basically for the, uh, the number of accumulated days employed at the original employer. So what you see is in column uh, one, you see a significant effect for 3-0 adoption was basically saying that their workers in 3-0 adopting firms are, they have more stable employment biographies in the first place. But once you control for the individual level variables, and especially also the firm level characteristics, then this difference becomes insignificant and small. So basically saying that conditional on those variables, they are actually comparable. And uh, similar is true for employment at different employers, for unemployment, and also for our wage changes in, as you can see, in panel D. So there is a selection, but it seems that our rich set of variables uh, that we have are capturing this quite well. So let's move to the, to the results. So this are, these are the uh, results for the employment stability. So Let's again start with panel A, which is basically, first of all, all firms. We then distinguish between service providers and manufacturers. So panel A, all firms, and then the outcome employed at original employer. And what we can see here is that, uh, again, we see a positive effect on the number of days employed in column one without controls, and the effect diminishes once we control for individual level characteristics, which makes sense, but it still remains significant and positive, suggesting uh, that employment stability or the number of accumulated days employed after five years um, in a, uh, for workers that, that are still employed in the original firm is 63 days higher in response to three zero uh, investments. And we do not find any significant effect for four zero um, uh, adopters. And also we do not find a significant effect um, if we look at employed at different employers. Um, or at least not once controlled for all variables or controls that we have, also no effect for the unemployed days. I mean, there's a negative uh, coefficient, but it's not significant. Now, if you now go to compare all the estimates in panel one to, or panel A to panel B and C, basically dividing firms into service providers and manufacturers, you see that those positive effects on employment stability for workers still employed at the original firms, so the stayers, um, it's it's basic, mainly driven by service providers. I think that's an interesting result, and um, it's also confirmed throughout all the analysis that we that we conducted. Now let me go to another outcome: wages, because we there find a little bit of a different effect here. So um, same same setup. So on the left hand side we have the changes in wages across the five year time span, and uh, again panel A reflecting all firms. Again, columns one to three reflecting um, workers employed at the original uh, employer. And then we find actually there's also, there are positive effects after controlling for all our controls. 
uh, on three zero adopters, but it's not significant. But however, the, the effect for four zero adopters is significant. Yeah, so, um, so we find it uh, uh, roughly um, that uh, the adoption of four zero technologies leads to a 2.7 2 percentage points increase in wage growth. And uh, we, we find wage, redux wage reductions for workers that are employed at a different employer for the switches. And again, if you uh, compare panel A to panel B and C, we see that all those effects, those beneficial effects are actually driven by service providers. It's even the case that even the, uh, for three zeros, uh, three zero adopters, the uh, effect is significant. But obviously, uh, yeah, since the effect for the manufacturers is uh, much less positive, uh, it doesn't um, it doesn't show up in the in the in the in the, in the, in the panel A. So basically, we see um, so to sum up, we see on, on average a positive effect on employment uh, with respect to 3.0 adoption, but the wage effects seem to run only through workers. Uh, that remain employed at the same firm in, uh, in response to 4.0 adoption. And one hypothesis could be that the um, um, that uh, 4.0 uh, uh, the, uh, so the missing employment effects for 4.0 adopters could be because these firms are still in an in an, uh, in an investment phase, so they haven't really expanded in the way they uh, they will in the, in the coming future, and that the wage wage effects are actually reflecting uh, their growth pattern that they're searching for. For, for workers, but haven't uh, been able to employ them yet. That could be could be one hypothesis. But it also could uh, it also another another explanation could be that four zero technologies actually mean less labor input, um, um, despite better paid. Uh, so these are potential uh, hypotheses um, where we yeah that that could that could explain our results. So let me. Um, I would have two questions. Yeah. Uh, so the first is uh, all these wages uh, adjusted for inflation effects. I mean, yeah, it's... they are all price adjusted. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And uh, for the other one, uh, the slide before, I'm I'm wondering uh, how you would interpret that in terms of that you showed that uh, there is actually a negative effect of being employed at a different employer, and uh, so a lot of these these uh, individuals actually stay at the at the employer they are currently at. Now you could say, well, that's precisely what you want, right? I mean, because apparently these are the good jobs and they're staying at the job. And um, I'm thinking of a, a couple of my friends uh, working in the, in the tech industries. And I mean, they're switching their employer every second year because they just want to get the experience and network and so on. And uh, I'm wondering whether you would not actually want to observe that they're going to different employers because the, the labor world has completely changed and it's, it's not a virtue anymore to stay at the same employer for 10 years, right? I mean, um, so obviously that's a normative question and I'm, I'm not sure you can, can say anything about it, but uh, yeah, I would be interested in what you think about yeah. it. So I mean, at least uh, on average, uh, the effect is, I mean, it's negative, but not really significant. So it's not really that we find robust uh, effects here in terms of that uh, that cl clear evidence that technology option leads to more workers leaving the firm, and um, but of course that but the correlation is negative. And what you are saying, of course, I mean, I I, I think we would to, to answer that question, we would need to split up the levers into those that actually move towards other technology adopters versus those that move to non adopters to then show that. Uh, the first would be what you are telling, uh, what you are saying. So some really some uh, specialists that uh, move from job to job and 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 always profiting from that in terms of better, higher employment stability and higher wages. But obviously, this suggests that the bulk of those that are leaving, um, or more more of those that are leaving, actually uh, see a decline in employment stability. Yeah. Although I mean, also this is only counting the number of days. It could be that. They are earning a lot of money, and they may, might want to work less. Uh, could also be reflected there. So that's why um, uh, it would be more informative to look at the net wages, which is suggesting a negative effect. So that that's actually suggesting that they're not really uh, they're actually on on net. They're actually suffering. Uh, they are seeing bad worse worse jobs. Yeah. So it's more supporting the story that those that remain at the firm they see higher stability, higher wages, and those that leave. Although I said we have to, we would have to distinguish those type of levers, but the bulk of those actually see uh, uh, less positive effects. 
So let me go to some uh, Rust checks that, are, that we did. So there's a lot of what we did, but I won't go, I would just mention the highlights. I mean, uh, there are some issues related to the technology adoption measure, the weighting of production and office. We do some robustness checks there. Perhaps more interesting is that we also just get rid of this aggregation. So basically say, let's assume that um, service providers, which is mostly true also, mainly use office and communication equipment and producers mainly use production equipment. And then so simply assigning those tools to the different types of firms. And uh, it is actually showing quite robust and also confirming that uh, the effects are driven really by service providers and office communication uh, equipment. We also distinguish between early versus recent adoption, um, suggesting that it's really driven by the recent technology adoption. So it's not that our results are largely reflected um, uh, it's, not, it's not reflecting uh, firms that have already been investing and just seem to be classified as an adopter, although they did not do anything. Um, we also do some robustness checks related to the number of days employed. Uh, so we use a, a logit model and looking at the probability to be employed in five years. Um, it also confirms our results mainly. And then we also look at cumulative earnings. That's perhaps also interesting because it shows that Obviously, the wage growth effects uh, for, for zero adopters, they do not lead to higher earnings incomes uh, because of the missing employment effects. Whereas for the three zero adopters, these uh, higher, the higher employment stability actually also leads to higher earnings. So remember, earnings is the number of days employed times wages. And um, yeah, we also do some checks regarding selection of unobservants. So um, I don't know how much time I still have, but um, just, just give me a signal, but uh, I can say a little bit more about, um, about the uh, adjustments, heterogeneous adjustments across worker groups. And um, so, oh, I don't know why this is, uh, let me check if, uh, yeah, it's somehow it's yellow in my, uh, here, I don't know why. Uh, okay. So what we do here is um, we basically, distinguish workers according to different dimensions. So the one is occupational fields. So we have a specific classification from the, uh, from the IEB that classifies occupations into segments or to, to, to fields. Um, so distinguishing between um, uh, uh, production jobs, service, personal service jobs, um, business service jobs, IT jobs, commercial service jobs. And we, what we see here is that uh, there are positive effects are mainly uh, um, working through IT occupations. So, it's so we see shifts towards IT occupations. Which on the left-hand side, it's, it's employment, and on the right-hand side, it's wages. So for wages, these, these shifts towards IT occupation is confirmed, but we moreover find also positive wage effects for personal service jobs that seem to not show up in, uh, in, in the employment results that could be hinting towards these labor supply constraints. So not enough workers uh, that are um, basically found for these type of jobs. Um, we also look at requirement levels. So we see that these shift spots, IT occupations is actually also correlated a lot with shifts towards expert jobs. So if we classify our workers into helpers, semi-skilled semi workers, specialists and experts, we see a large shift towards expert jobs in terms of employment. In terms of wages, we also see some shifts towards specialists. Um, and um, if we now move to tasks, uh, where we can use the classical from Otto Levy and Menain, so classical distinction of tasks, we basically see that the main shifts are towards non-routine analytic tasks. Although um, I have to say that to we concentrate on the main tasks, it's very hard in our data to distinguish between non-routine analytic and non-routine interactive. So it, it could be capturing both. And, um, uh, and it, it also shows up in wages, uh, this positive effect for non-routine analytic jobs. And then finally, we also look at education and there are maybe a little bit of surprising. So there's not a very clear pattern here, but at least we can say, I mean, uh, it's not that we find any larger positive effects for the, for the, for the university degree uh, uh, workers, which was something that we maybe assumed. It's maybe concentrated on workers in the medium skilled class. So they have a vocational training degree that shows up both in, uh, in employment and also in wages. And that could be suggesting either that uh, obviously our 
vocational training degree program, there is, I think, evidence for that, that in these occupations, you do actually have pretty high skilled workers that are very, very specialized on certain IT jobs. And um, so that could be reflecting this, but it could also be reflecting the, the lack of positive effects for, uh, for academics could also be reflecting um, that um, labor shortages in this segment. That's another explanation. So now, um, finally, uh, the last analysis that we did is that we wanted to see whether all these shifts that I've been showing you so far are for the workers um, that, that, were, um, that were basically already employed in our firms in 2016, but we also look at the hiring margin. So we're looking at what are the people that have been entering the jobs after 2011. And uh, that's that's this analysis, and it's some it's not a fully fledged analysis, but it's it's, it's a rough uh, estimate of what's going on there. And so what we do here is we just create a, a variable, the probability to start a new job in either three zero adopter or four zero adopter. And um, obviously the most uh, and we have some, a couple of variables that we use: age, occupation, fields, experts, requirements, um, university degree, and we basically find the largest positive effect or, or we find some significant effects for business service jobs that could speak towards some business expansions at the hiring margin. And um, we also find uh, some evidence that at least for 4-0, um, uh, that it, it's, it's restructuring towards expert jobs. And uh, there's even a positive effect for the university degree variable, but it, it kind of like uh, becomes insignificant again once you control for the expert variable. Um, but it's there in comparison to the other analysis that we did so far. This again could suggest that at the hiring margin, we do see these, uh, that there are, um, there are, that these firms are hiring these graduates, um, um, uh, uh, whereas they're not showing up overall in the other analysis. Uh, I think that could also fit to the story that uh, it's simply hard to find these workers currently. So let me, let me conclude. Um, so what we, what would have, what, what, what I have tried to show you is that with our new data set uh, on technology adoption across German firms, that on average there's still a low share of firms that invest into those technologies, but the uh, the growth is uh, is large. So it's so these few frontier firms are investing strongly in those technologies. We see increased employment stability, wage growth, and accumulative uh, earnings in response to technology adoption. Although um, the effects they split differently across digital technology types. So whereas we find uh, the positive employment and earnings effects for 3.0 uh, technologies, we found we found more pronounced wage growth effects for 4.0 technologies. And um, yeah, one hypothesis that I already stressed a little bit was that it could reflect that we are in this investment phase where firms are investing and still adjusting their workforce, looking for skilled workers, and that could be reflected in the results. Um, but it also could reflect that simply 4.0 technologies are less, um, uh, are more labor saving or less, less uh, labor enhancing. And uh, there are, have been some, some, yeah, some, some studies uh, asking the question, how brilliant are these new technologies? This could refer to that discussion. Um, and I think one core result that fits really well to, the, to other studies in literature is that the adjustments that we find are mainly driven by service providers. Um, pointing towards uh, the fact that perhaps uh, there seems to be some larger evidence that technologies used in service providers seem to create more complementarities to workers uh, um, uh, in contrast to manufacturing technologies. And um, nevertheless, despite these average effects, we find that the shifts towards IT jobs, we actually show in the paper a more detailed way what actually our classification actually is capturing there. So we're really talking about um, IT jobs where programming skills are highly required. So it's really uh, actually also programming uh, that that is being that is becoming more important. Things like uh, jobs in like IT security consultant, cloud engineer, I, I, AI specialists, and it's uh, workers with vocational training degree profit most from this technology upgrading. And um, but uh, as I stressed, it's. Uh, obviously interesting that we find, we do not find these large beneficial effects for our graduates that could point perhaps to our German vocational training system or labor shortages. Well, thanks a lot. <laughs>